Okay, welcome to another episode of the Women Pepreneurs podcast with your host, Mario Quendo. This is a continuation of the Educator Series. Okay, so my guest today is Angie Coates. Hey, Angie. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, no, my pleasure. All right, so for those who are watching, I yes, I am in my summer office. Okay, so I've got my umbrella overhead and it's casting weird shadows, but you know, I'm outside working, so it's all good. So, Angie, let's start off with um, how did you get involved in the pet industry? Um, I needed a, a part time job. Um, and so I started, I applied at a grooming salon and I didn't get the job. But the owner of the salon said, well, you know, come back from time to time and, you know, you seem nice. Maybe we can find a spot for you at some point. So I went back every week, every single week. <laughs> and by the end of the first month, she was like, hello. Again, no, I don't have anywhere to put you. And then she got the phone call from the bather she had hired who called in sick yet again for the third time in the first month. And she's like, wait, actually, can you start today? Can you bathe dogs? And I'm like, yep. And that's how I got my first job. Um, and because one of the other groomers is like, well, I mean, she is doing everything that, you know, they tell you to do. Um, if you want the job, keep going back. And she keeps coming back. <laughs> So that's how I got my first uh, my first spot at a, at a grooming salon. Okay, that's that's a pretty cool story. I don't think I've heard that one before. Yeah, yeah, I just uh, kept showing up. Okay, all right. It's... Hi, hire me. Well, you know what? I'm I'm gonna say what I like about you the most is the fact that you do have this a great deal of perseverance. <laughs> eventually they had to hire me because I just would have gone every week until they did. So I think she understood that at that point. She was just like, yeah, whatever. You just, just, you can just work here. <laughs> All right. So um, you started off like, like a lot of us as bathers, right? Yeah. But at some point you decided you wanted to teach, correct? I did. I did. All right. All right, so why did you want to teach? Let's start there. All right, so what I wanted to do um, is I had I had been in the industry, I think at that point it was almost 30 years or wow. just over 30 years. And I had taught, I had trained seven groomers at that point. And I just trained my eighth groomer and I wanted to be able to help other people to learn the different things that I have always taught my groomers. And so I took your class on speaking and how to be a speaker. As I was like, that would be really cool um, to, to learn how to do it the proper way rather than just kind of flying my seat in my pants. And uh, so I gave my first class on uh, personal safety. And I was terrified, <laughs> absolutely terrified. Um, but it's something I'm really passionate about. Uh, that's one of my, it's bunnies and personal safety are kind of all right, and salon sanitation. So those three classes are like my favorite to teach because I don't need to even look at the paper to go on and on and on for about 12 hours about all of them. <laughs> so I've taken your personal safety class. Now, where did you, where was the first place you taught that? Was that online or in person? It was online. Okay. So what was it like doing your doing a class online for the very first time? It was weird. It was really weird because I had, all right, so I had taught 
um, classes to other police officers um, about domestic violence and uh, from a woman's perspective and things that to try and help shape what they understood about the subject and being on uh, a domestic call. And so I had taught that. And then I had taught a class for nurses for years about um, a, uh, assaults on children. Um, and I did that for, I don't even, many years. I don't even know how many at this point. And so teaching online was really weird because there's no, the flow of the class is directed by the class. So like you can see the people. So you get the, you know, it's a, a give and take and there's no people. So it was really, really weird. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that was, that was weird, but I had been prepared. You prepared me for this very thing, you know? Um, so it, I mean, it turned out okay, but it was odd not having an audience to in like really face-to-face -face engage with and get that feedback because you can tell when they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, you can see that they don't understand what you're trying to get to. Um, or you can see when they go, oh, right, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And you can see the connection light behind their eyes. Um, where online, you're just kind of like, <laughs> let's hope for the best here. <laughs> okay, so it's definitely a different animal. Yeah. All right, and so, and compare that to the first class you taught in the pet industry, at a venue. What was that first class, by the way? It was Atlanta. It was Atlanta Pet Fair, and it was my salon sanitation class. And uh, God, it's awesome. It was, I mean, the class was packed. Uh, there must have been, I think there were 75 people in the class. Okay. And it was so good. It was just a the rolling feedback of questions and answers and making sure they understood because a lot of the salon sanitation is very technical. Um, and I was a, a biology major um, in, in college and microbiology was my love, I love that class. Um, and by the way, just to clarify, I won in the lab for growing, we had to do uh, bacterial samples and everybody else had like gone out and scrubbed and like swiped toilet seeds and the, the foam, you know, out. Yes, the, the, I went to college when there were pay phones. Um, I just, I literally didn't leave the lab. I just, uh, I lifted up my left shoe and I swabbed, swabbed it. I lifted up my right shoe and I swabbed that. And then I put those in the Petri dishes and covered it. I'm like, oh, I'm done. I got my two swabs. And uh, I grew the, it, it literally grew like the most amazing stuff overnight. <laughs> Sneakers, shoes are absolutely disgusting. Don't wear my house. <laughs> I wrote a blog or an article for Groomer to Groomer. I forget which one. And it was on tracking stuff into your salons. I'm going to have to go dig that up and figure out where that was. Because if it was a blog, I'll make it into an article. Yeah. Um, uh, the absolute, it's why doctors and vets wear shoe coverings. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Your shoes are absolutely the grossest things. And you would think a public toilet would be really dirty or a, a public pay phone would be really dirty and, I, and they were make no mistake they were um but and these weren't like i wasn't doing anything extraordinary with these shoes they were just like regular old shoes 
Yeah. Good to know. <clears throat> so anyway, all right. So you so I guess moving it along, there's a little bit of a digression. Okay. So your salon sanitation class went well. Oh, oh I guess so. Angie and I are at the Idaho show. Okay. And I'm teaching the pet first aid class and she's teaching the salon sanitation class. And I guess we took a break around the same time and we're in the bathroom and I'm in the middle and the girl who was taking the first aid class was on one side of me and her friend was on the other side of me. So the one girl goes, Oh, we're, we're learning so much. What are you learning in your class? Right. And she goes, I'm thoroughly disgusted. And she, I go, you're taking Angie's class, right? And she goes, yep, yep. Yeah. But it taking that class, I heard from so many people that taking that class and truly understanding what bacteria and disgusting funk that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is enlightening, terrifying, horrible, and yet really good information. Yeah. Because once you understand what we are actually dealing with every day, all day, that it can really shape your protocols and completely change them. And uh, I get really excited when I see them like the day after or two days after, and they're like, oh my God, so I got all the things. And I, and I did, we got all this, and I went to the dollar store and I got all these things that you said, because it's really inexpensive to reshape your protocols to do things properly. And I designed them that way. You don't have to spend a ton of money to be able to clean and disinfect and sanitize your salon uh, after each pet. So I'm looking for the most economic way to do it myself. And I'm sure that uh, the groomers that take my classes would be too. You know, it was why um, I had part of my protocols when I was mobile because I had floor mats everywhere because I'm going to be on my feet. But yeah. at the end of the day, all the floor mats were picked up. They were put in the tub and they were disinfected. <clears throat> and then to be put down on the floor in the morning because I was standing on them. All right. So I'm going <clears throat> from my van, to somebody's house, getting their dog, walking back, going to the next house, doing the same thing. I'm walking over a lot of different surfaces. Yeah. You know, and I was told I was crazy for doing that. And I'm like, but I'm walking on these things. Yeah. And so is the pet. Yep. So that's on the bottom of their feet as well. And you know that dogs are going to lick their feet, you know, because it's not like they, if they have an itch, they can just go, oh, scritchy, scritchy, scritch. No, they're going to chew it because that's the the way that they're able to do that you know they can't just take their other hand and go oh i have an itch here on my front arm no they're going to chew that they're going to chew the bottoms of their pads so all of that's going in their mouth yeah. very easy way to to spread any type of zoonotic disease or bacteria okay so um i do i do love the fact that more and more speakers are coming into the industry that are not just breed trims. I mean, it is our industry. We need them, all yeah. right? Because that's a skill as a professional groomer we need to know. But yeah. there's so much more than putting a nice haircut on a pet and calling it a day. There's that salon sanitation. There's business classes. There's again, and personal safety is a huge thing it's, it, for people coming either into your facility or, or mobile and house call groomers going into someone's home. So I think there are really, really important topics. Um, I can remember um, going to house and the guy answering a door and I like to call his less than tidy whiteies. <sighs> Yeah, it's it's like oh god, um, I'm like yeah, I'm not I'm not coming. I, you know what? I always had a ready go to excuse at any point for leaving, because I'm not dealing with this. No, nor should you have to. No, there was there was a house called rumor where the guy answered the door in a pair of boxers, 
And he led her to the back of the house to a bathroom where she'd be grooming the dog. And by the time he got, they got to that bathroom, his, all his glory was out of his boxer shorts. Um, and she was like, oh my God. And then said, well, I have to go, go get my stuff. And then she ran out of the house, jumped in her car and left. Which, thank God, you know, she was able to leave. Yep. But the terrifying thing is, what if she wasn't? Yeah. And I don't like to necessarily play the what if game, but when it comes to personal safety, it's a factor. So, you know, I, Kate Klaus and I just spent a good deal of time uh, creating what is now, I believe, a six hour personal safety course that covers everything and uh kate was a, a chicago uh police officer all and right so my question for you guys is this going up on positive ed yes it is um so it's and you know we, we're gonna do it we still have to record it and uh so we can do it we we wanted to be able to do it at trade shows um so, you know, it will be a shortened version. Probably we'll have a one hour, two hour and four hour. But there's so much material to cover safety at trade shows, everyday safety, situational awareness, safety in mobile grooming, safety in house call grooming, safety in the salon. Um, what are some things that you can and should do what about when you're um when you're working alone um there's i mean there's literally a myriad and then the next thing we're working on is uh emergency preparedness yes and so all right so you work alone and you broom 150 pound dogs okay so now how can you as a single individual lift the dead, dead weight of 150 pound dog? Because they're not conscious to help you. Can you? Is that even possible for you to do that? And if it's not, that's a factor. So it's something you have to consider. So if a 150 pound, <clears throat> 150 pound dog goes down in the salon, you're working alone. How exactly are you going to get that dog to your car? Can you? Um, uh, I know I can't. <clears throat> so that it's a factor. So that's Kate had brought to the Teton show a stuffed dog. And she had put uh weighted sandbags in the stuffed dog, and it was 30 pounds. And a lot of the groomers who were like, Yeah, oh, I you know, I groom dogs, there's no weight limit. She says, Okay, come pick up this dog and they couldn't because it is dead weight and 30 pounds of dead weight was very very different than a 30 pound dog that's helping you pick them up so it's more it feels more like 50 or 75 pounds which were some of the guesses when she asked how much do you think it weighs oh it's got to be 75 pounds now it's 30 and you're saying your weight limit is 50 so little factors that people don't really consider do you know what 50 pounds of dead weight actually feels like because it's an it's an issue all right so why so why did you come up with the rabbit let's first of all the rabbit grooming program that you have what was the the um why did you do that and then tell us about the book. All right. So I've been grooming rabbits for 20 years. And I loved grooming rabbits. And when I started my salon, um, I wanted that separate room for cats and for rabbits and guinea pigs and ferrets and all the small mammals so that I could have everything in one space. And then... Um, people started asking me, uh, how do you groom rabbits? Because there's a lot to it. It's not like grooming a dog. It's not like grooming a cat. 
uh, rabbits are prey, and there's a lot of different things that you can do that will actually kill a rabbit that mm -hmm. you do as a matter of course for a cat or dog. So I wanted to educate others about it because I was seeing it in the groups all the time. You know, people cutting, trimming, a, say, an Angora rabbit and trimming off the whiskers. Well, that's their near vision. You trim those whiskers off and you're blinding the rabbit because they their distance vision is superb, but their near vision is exceptionally poor and you just cut it all off. So I was trying to educate people as the posts were coming up, but it wasn't enough. I mean, there was no, there was, you know, I didn't have an hour every time a rabbit post came up to like type out this whole thing. And I said, the heck with it. And you said, well, make a course on it. And I was like, oh, okay. So I did. <laughs> and, uh, and then you said, now write the book for it. So I did. <laughs> and uh, that's how the quintessential rabbit book was born. I, so uh, talk a little bit about the book. When it, what went into writing that book? Oh my goodness. Blood, sweat, tears. Um, okay. So I spent about a year writing and then I passed it to two small mammal vets. One that is really, uh, he's almost rabbit exclusive. He does see some guinea pigs um, and other small mammals, but for the most part, he is Dr. And that's Dr. Matt Ford. Um, his veterinary hospital is in Kennebunk, Maine. And he is incredible. This is the guy that if your rabbit needs that surgery that every other vet on the planet is saying, oh, no, no, th this, that you can't do anything with this. We're going to have to do put your rabbit down you take the rabbit to him and he goes no I can do this I've done it 150 times and he does and the rabbit lives and has a splendid normal life from then on uh so I gave him a copy of the book and uh and then I gave a copy of the book to Dr. Cliff Faber and I asked them to please review it for accuracy and content so they both did and Dr. Ford asked me to uh, make some additions. He's like, oh, don't forget this and don't forget that. And you got to put this in. And Dr. Faber did the same. And he said, you know, put this in and put that in. And so I put all these pieces in, had him review it again. And they're like, yep, that's good. Everything looks, looks really good. And then um, Dr. Ford wrote the forward to my book. And um, because we both see rabbits are more like horses than they are like dogs or cats. So we both have that. The first time I had ever talked to Dr. Ford, um, cause we share a client, a number of clients, uh, but it was one particular client I was calling him about and, um, and, you know, asking him what he thought I should do for in the best interest of the, of the, uh, the rabbit going forward and uh and we discussed how rabbits are really just teeny tiny horses so okay <laughs> so um so you have the the program and yeah, i know you went up with the um, offering a certification yes yes there are four levels um the first is basically rabbit assistant that's the foundational knowledge on how to handle how to understand the body language, the auditory cues, um, the different coat types, um, the breeds, and um, you know, like that kind of thing. It's foundational. It's where you everybody needs to start, and what you need to understand, um, so that you can groom a rabbit safely and have no harm come to them in in your in your grooming, and then. Uh, Level two is um, rabbit groomer. That's a short-haired rabbit grooming. And then level three is um, certified rabbit groomer, which is uh, haircuts for angoras, uh, lion heads, things like this. Um, and then level four is certified master rabbit groomer. And that is dealing with a pelted rabbit, which is 
rabbit skin is like a zipper. You can have a teeny tiny cut and it's just going to go zip. And it's really easy to cut a rabbit because they're, it's basically like shaving uh, a furry raisin. So if you don't know the anatomy exceptionally well, it is not going to be good. So that's a different skill level than giving, say, a scissor cut to a rabbit or a clipper cut um, can, because one, you, it's pelted. So you can't see what's under there. You have to already know. Okay. So it's very, very different than like just a shave down on a money that you do every, say, four to six weeks. All right. <clears throat> and so upcoming trade shows, where can we find you? I will be in Colorado in a number of days. Um, all right. So this will be afterwards. Yes. This is will air after Colorado. Okay, so after Colorado, I will be teaching at, the next one will be Hershey. All right, what are you teaching at Hershey? Uh, training the, on Saturday, training the neurodiverse employee. So um, as someone who is neurodiverse, we work a little bit different. And um, throughout the years, some of my employees have been neurodiverse. And in order to help us all fl to flourish, there are certain tips and tricks that um, make things easier. So I wanted to share that with uh, the neurotypical um, employers so that maybe they could get an understanding of easy ways, simple ways that they could help uh, a neurodiverse employee to flourish within their salon. Yeah, and, and just then, to make note on that, um, the pet industry attracts a much higher percentage of the neurodiverse than almost any other industry. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of reasons for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, and then on Sunday, I'm teaching ferret and guinea pig grooming. Okay. Which is really, really fun. Um, I really enjoy my ferret and guinea pig clients. They're, uh, they're a blast. They're ridiculous. Okay. I did groom ferrets at when I worked for Petco. Yep. And it was the store ferrets. Sure. You know, because they get pretty disgusting. They have a naturally oily coat. Yep. So, but you need to maintain that coat without stripping it. So it's, yes, you can strip all the oils out of that coat. And yes, that ferret will be clean. However, you're doing a great disservice to that animal because they actually need the oils in your coat. You see, I had no, no knowledge, no information on how to, it was just, they handed me a bottle of ferret shampoo off the shelf. Yeah. And said, give these guys a bath. Yeah, that's how it's often done. Yeah. Um, and it's like, and they're funny. They're like ridiculous little, they're furry snakes. Um, yeah. And they're fun and they're funny and they really like their bath. And, but there's, you know, there's a few things that you need to know to, to deal with uh, grooming with the ferret. And so that's what the class is about. And guinea pigs, that's how I started in rabbit grooming. It was by grooming a guinea pig named Rumble. And uh, he was the coolest guinea pig ever, like in the history of ever. Rumble was the number one guinea pig. Uh, hands down. <laughs> he did yoga. His mom was a yoga instructor and he actually did yoga. Like that's one I would go to yoga. And by the way, I'm still like the world's worst yoga person um, because the whole time I was watching Rumble because it was the cutest thing. She's doing like mountain pose and there's a little Rumble doing mountain pose. And I'm just like, that is awesome. Um, and she'd be like, Angie, and I'm like, right, huh? huh? Oh, uh, yeah, oh, right. I'm, I'm doing the thing. What are we doing? Uh <laughs> All right. So when my daughters had guinea pigs, so back in the day when glamour shots was a thing. Oh, yeah. All right. The, a lot of times, at least the ones where we were, they would partner with the shelters and they, you could bring your pets in and they would have a contest and 
uh, whatever proceeds went went to the shelter. So somewhere I have glamour shots of guinea pigs. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm I'm sure you do because guinea pigs are they're just so much fun. They're absolutely ridiculous little creatures, and uh, they, All right, I'll I'll rephrase that. I actually don't have those pictures anymore. They were in the tub of photos that when we were moving, went down to my daughter's house in Atlanta. So Cindy has somewhere in that tub, glamor shots of guinea pigs. <laughs> I don't know if I can like coax her into looking for them or not. That's awesome. However, if I do, <clears throat> I will make sure I post them. Yes, please do. I want to see, I want to see the glamor shots of guinea pigs because I have um, a few guinea pigs that come in routinely and uh, they're both owned by, by little boys and they save their chore money that they earn to have the guinea pigs nails done. And because they, which is $20 that they're paying for the snail trip, but they pay me and they tip me and to kind of reward them for, for doing, you know, saving up that money, I always give them a free picture. So I take them into the picture room and I say, okay, we're going to offer a couple of different costumes and we'll see which one the guinea pig likes best. And there's this one guinea pig, Flash. Oh my God, I love Flash. He is the sweetest guinea pig on the planet. And his little boy loves him to death. And so we always put uh, Flash in a costume that Flash picks out of the ones that we offer. And he, I had him in like riding an elephant for the circus theme because I have an Ottoman elephant. And then he was riding the bull for the uh, cowboy theme. And uh, he was wearing a uh, like a, a rainbow mohawk for the 80s theme. And yeah, Flash is just, he's the coolest guinea pig ever. And that little boy loves him two pieces. Okay, so my question for you is, how do you know which costume the guinea pig chooses? Oh, it's lit. So you lay, I lay them out and they'll usually smell all of them. And then the one they start chewing on, that's the one they wear. Okay. And I'm like, all right, that's the one. And I put it on and they're like, yeah, cool. And then they don't like fuss. But if I just pick a costume and stick it on them, they, they start doing the backup thing. They're like, no, 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 uh, he, uh, it's on my head. Blah. But if they pick the costume, they're just like, I'm awesome. And they just sit there. And these are the same guinea pigs that if I pick one and stick it on them, they're not okay with it. But if they pick it, then they're perfectly fine with it. Okay. To like down to like itty bitty little guinea pig size sunglasses. <laughs> and they'll just sit there like, yeah, I'm awesome. And I have like a teeny tiny little like uh, lounge chair, you know, like a summer lounge chair that you'd put outside, but it's like micro size. And so there it is with the little itty bitty guinea pig size towel. And they sit in the little itty bitty chair with their sunglasses on and a teeny tiny uh, Hawaiian shirt. And they're just like, yeah, I'm cool. It's ridiculously cute. Yeah. And he, so I print them up every, the, all the pictures for all the pets that we groom at the end of every month. And uh, cause with a full grooming, you get a, a picture. And so with the Guinea pigs for the little boys, they get the free picture too. And so I print them up and he has them all over his room and he gets them sized up. So they're not just the four by six, they're like eight by tens. And he's got one on canvas that his mom got him for, I think it was, I think it was Christmas, might've been his birthday, I'm not sure. Um, but he has flashed like all <laughs> the room. Cutest, cutest thing, cutest thing. Okay. All right. So do you have any words of wisdom for someone who's thinking about wanting to teach? All right. So yes. One, 
it's something you can do if you want to. Two, the second thing is whatever skill you desire in your life, you need to become educated on how to do it. It's that simple. Like grooming, we didn't just walk in and go, nah, I can groom. Really? Uh, but there's so much you don't know. And yes, there are self-taught groomers, but they got the education that they're using to be self-taught from someone. And they go to trade shows. So they're learning there. They're watching YouTube videos. There's they're acquiring the education that they need to do that somewhere. And like when I got my cricket, I'm like, okay, how do I, what? Because I'm looking at the instructions and this is not covering anything. So I went online and I did tons and tons of hours of watching YouTube videos of how, how do I do this? How do I make this better? How do I make it right? And I just got back from teaching someone else how to do that very thing for two days. And with the, with the cricket, um, because now I, the student has become the teacher. So learn, take classes and learn on how, how to become a speaker, um, how to put a class together how to do all of this, because for any skill you have, you are going to want the education to be able to do it well. Okay, so Angie, thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your day to be here. I appreciate it. And so everybody join us next week when I interview um, another person, because we're now not just the women petpreneurs, <clears throat> um, making a difference in the pet industry.